What is up, Rad Potential YouTube? Welcome to the shop at the Rad Ranch, where we have probably the most beautiful car that is ever gonna be in here by the world standards. Now, I might think that a 1976 Mazda RX-5 Cosmo is beautiful, but a lot of people don't. So this is the world's most beautiful car being in my shop, one of the few. The FDRX-7 is pretty much one of my favorite cars on the planet. This is a car that has inspired me to do what I do in life with rotary engines. It's inspired me to get RX-7s. Now, like I said, I will probably never own an FD RX-7, but I have a lot of RX-7s, rotary trucks, rotary engines, and this is the car that inspired me to do all of that. And ultimately, this one right here is probably exactly the car that I would build if I was going to build myself an FD RX-7. Period, correct. OEM plus, nothing crazy, wild, loud, fast, whatever, whatever. Just a prime example of a car you can take out on the weekends. It makes the right noises. It handles fantastic. And it, it does five tenths back road cruising super well. And you get all the flashiness of having a yellow FD. The only thing I would change on it is I really want the yellow Type R, like 2001, 2002 one. I like that yellow a little bit better than CYM, but that's just my opinion. This is still a beautiful color. So this video is going to accompany the Bring a Trailer ad. It's August 17th, 2022. Just want to put that in there so you know this wasn't filmed before or after anything crazy. We're going to kind of do a walk around of this car. I'm going to show you some stuff and then kind of tell you the things I like in my FD story, kind of sort of. So hopefully you enjoy that. Let's get right to it. First things first, let's start with the engine bay. The car has a 1.3 liter rotary engine, sequential twin turbos, and they're tiny, like super tiny, like that big tiny. They make instant boost, or as close to instant boost as I would say that I have probably ever felt in my life. And these cars with this setup, it's just, it's its, its own experience. If you go watch the previous video while I was driving this car, that should also be linked. The, the car is, is of another world. It's, 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 it's hard to compare it to something else, you know, for the price point, like comparing it to a Porsche or Corvette or this, that, and the other. It's hard to. The rotary engine is so unique, and if you've never driven one, go drive one. But this car's engine bay in particular is nearly exactly how I would want it set up. So OEM Plus, right? You don't see anything here that's crazy out of the ordinary, aside from aluminum intercooler, boost controllers, which could be hidden somewhere else, mechanical boost controllers. And then there's a power FC running the car. Now, this car, when Johnny put this together, has brand new from Mazda engine harness and a brand new from Mazda charge harness on this side. The reason you do that, okay, when you get an FD RX-7 and you take this thing apart for the first time, it's a 30 year old, heat soaked, super hot engine bay rotary car. The engine harness is gonna be like cracking spaghetti noodles when you take it apart. You will pull the harness out and it's gonna stay spider web form fit to how it fit on the engine. When you replace those harnesses, like this engine's been out, everything's been refreshed under here, all put back together, you put new harnesses in, you just extend the life of your car another 30 years. You can go on, bring a trailer, an auction website, find the most mint perfect RX-7, right? 4,000 miles, never been driven. It's still a 30 year old car. The rubber under the engine, in the engine bay is still 30 years old. The suspension bushings are still 30 years old. Just because it has low miles doesn't mean that the car is gonna drive fantastically. All those things need to be moved. They can harden up. This one has all your wear items replaced. Injectors cleaned, new O-rings, gaskets everywhere. Everything is fresh, fresh belts, this, that, and the other. It's been maintained. It's the car you wanna buy because you wanna drive this car, not because you wanna park it in a museum. So, a little bit of some close up, new washer tank. I think it has a new coolant tank. You know, titanium bolts on this is a little bit extra. It has a titanium hood prop, which is a little bit extra, but better than black. Has a brand new HKS twin power, fresh plugs, plus fresh wires. Everything has been meticulously put together. The car runs fantastic. You'll see in the compression test video, starts prime, hot and cold. As far as upgrades in here, in addition, 
to this. One of the other huge upgrades, and this is where we'll get to like making this have OEM plus performance. Okay, so this is a 1993 car. The 93s have smaller turbos than the later model cars. 1999 and up, I think, was the biggest turbo change. I know there were some intermittent changes throughout the years over in Japan and because and, we didn't get this car post-95, but the 99 bigger turbos are bolted onto this car. Manual boost controllers to make sure that the car maintains its 10, 8, 10 boost pattern. So what that means is with the sequential turbos, it makes 10 pounds of boost during the changeover, it makes eight, and then it goes back up to 10 and carries that out to the red line. Now, you can turn the boost up on these with these stock turbos and make decent horsepower. I've got a buddy who's made close to 300 wheel with these turbos, and that car is a fantastic car to drive. And it would be a great way to kind of optimize the combo per se of the FDRX7 with its stock engine and just a smooth idling Prius, epic boost, whatever, cool OEM plus car, right? Stock 99 turbos, they bolt right in, great upgrade. And you can make that horsepower the same with the regular 93 turbos and turn the boost up. And there's all sorts of upgrades to up, or all sorts of things you can do to upgrade the frames of those, put Garrett frames in them from BNR and this, that, and the other. And that would be a great option if your turbos go. It's pretty common on these cars for turbo seals to fail whenever. But stock airbox, super clean engine bay, and it just makes it fresh. I mean, the only thing you could really want to clean this up is maybe do an ABS delete, but when your car is so clean and so nice, when your ABS brake lines and stuff aren't rusty crusty, you don't need to delete it because it looks fantastic. I would rather have a super clean ABS unit in there than hastily delete one. The exterior of the FDR X7, arguably what everyone in the world is gonna to agree to be the best part of the car. Get rid of the rotary reliability issues, put an LS in this car and you have a more pretty looking pop-up headlights Corvette, right? This car has the 99 spec front bumper. It is an OEM Mazda piece. It has a Shine Auto Works, I think is the company. Uh, it's like a Mazda speed style lip. It's got Shine side skirts on it, the OEM replica side skirts. And then it has the same rear spats. This has 99 spec taillights, has a 99 spec Mazda wing with a, I think this is a shine piece also, um, carbon fiber deck lid in there or, or wicker bill or whatever you want to call it. Um, this guy. Other than that, there is no body modifications done to this car. This is how an FD is supposed to look from the factory. You can do wide bodies on these, you can do the feed fenders, you can do aggressive bumpers and this, that, and the other. But honestly, this is how this car was designed to look and it just looks proper with those OEM aero improvements. And I love it, it's so good. The car has been painted, okay? So in order to match the front bumper and the wing, this car came from Hawaii. I've got probably have some pictures somewhere I can dig up of when the car came here in 2019 to get the engine pulled and this, that, and the other. Um, it wasn't in bad shape. This car was in really good shape, but when you go ahead and try to match yellows and do this, that, and the other, it's way easier just to paint the whole car. Everything matches, fix up the clear coat that was coming off here and there. The car did not need any body work. It was in really good shape, minimal stuff, a couple of dents maybe here and there, but it had, you know, no huge issues whatsoever around the car. Matched up. It did have carbon fiber headlight covers, which the headlight cover is the bane of the Mazda RX-7 FD's body existence. They're plastic, they crack, they fly off randomly, and they're expensive to get, and then you have to have them painted to match. So I'd put fixed headlights on my car, but stoked with how this thing came out. I would not be afraid at all of a paint job on a car. If you take a car to a reputable body shop, have it done. This was done to the original CYM color. You can see, maybe not on this camera, um, but you can see the metallic flake, the gold flake that's in there, and it matches the door jams perfectly. So this car wasn't painted all the way through. And you can see here, new paint, original paint, looks fantastic. And I'm stoked for that. That's huge, huge kudos to a body shop that can match paint. In the world of classic cars, old cars, this car is 30 years old. A paint job doesn't, doesn't necessarily scare me away. What it does is it shows that the owner of the car 
wanted the car to look good. You can have a Survivor, CYM FD, and maybe if it had low miles and the paint wasn't great, it would probably sell more for a car that's been repainted of the exact same spec, right? But in my opinion, if you got the wherewithal to have a paint job done and you know a good body shop to get it done by, somebody that does good work, a paint job only makes the car more, more valuable to me because one, you know it's done right. Two, you know you're not gonna ever buff through your clear coat and you can keep it looking nice. And three, it's just way easier to be proud and super stoked to have a car that looks really fresh. You know, my rotary truck has a ton of patina and it gets a lot of, you know, weird looks and soccer moms don't like it because it's loud and doesn't have paint and stuff doesn't match, but people appreciate a car no matter how it's built. And when Johnny put this thing together and had it painted and had all the aero stuff match, you know, there was no intent of trying to flip this car or sell it or this, that, and the other, you know, it was painted because he wanted to own it for a long time. And that was a worthy investment. And I think the car looks fantastic. Moving to the interior. This is where my love for the FD kind of falters. And maybe I was inspired by the Fast and Furious FD with the fancy Stitchcraft interior. And I'm sure that Stitchcraft interior was super well put together and they didn't use any spray foam and make it crazy and this, that, and the other, and it was perfect. But an OEM FD interior is very hard to find in really good condition. At least all of the cars I've ever been around even that Montego blue one that I worked on a couple months back. When you start messing with 90s Japanese car interiors, you have to be very careful. I have mad respect for the guys at Tommy Effia's shop that work on all of his skylines because I would, like, he built a sky, this is a little aside, he built his R33 skyline in nine days. They did a dash swap in a 90s Japanese car in less than nine days. I would be so scared to start taking the dash out of an FD, it would just be crazy. So mad respect to those guys that can do that work and mad respect to Johnny for being able to get this car and get it put together the way that it is. So a few things that are different and updated in the car. Obviously it has the Nardi style steering wheel with the Mazda um, airbag in it. It does have the 93 stock uh, gauge cluster hood and all the gauges, everything's functional. The car does have, and we were able to get a good picture of it. You'll see it in the bring a trailer out or I'll put it up. The car does have a little bit of a line through the odometer. It is very common for these FD odometers to fail. They'll actually get like pixelated and hazy or they'll burn up. They kind of melt from the backside. I've seen a few people on the forums that are able to fix these with really good luck. So, there's an option there to remedy that, but you can still read the mileage perfectly on this car. It doesn't really hinder that in any way. It's not as bad as a lot of the other ones I've seen, but you're gonna see a difference. This one, the factory hood, okay, 93, is smooth plastic. That smooth plastic would have transitioned into smooth plastic all through the center console. The later model stuff, 94, has kind of a little bit of a texture to it. So this center console piece, the uh, armrest piece here is both 94 pieces of plastic. So they're in better shape. I like this texture a little bit better. It doesn't scratch as easy. The smooth plastic, you'll get fine scratches in it. And this just is way more sustainable. Um, all the buttons, everything works. Ashtray still in here. The cool part about this as well is this car has a Spirit R style shift knob, boot, e-brake handle, e-brake boot, and then the rest of the leather on the console has been rewrapped with red stitching as well. So this is a super nice piece. The leather is super tight. Um, I don't remember who Johnny had do that or if it's a piece you can buy, but it just makes, it takes a 90s Japanese car and makes it feel like more of a 90s luxury car. You know, like Japanese, they weren't really doing colored stitching and, and making the interior super crazy on these cars. They were fairly budget friendly cars back then. So this just livens it up. When you see the pictures of this interior, it is, it is beautiful. Another cool thing, this is an R1 model car. So the R1 car is kind of like the Z06 of RX-7s. It's stripped down, basic, 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 your race car package. Gets you dual oil coolers, a lip, a wing, and then it gets you these micro suede sweet seats these seats are epic okay i'm a big proponent of cloth seats 
because you don't fall out of the seats when you try to drive your car hard. These seats hug you really nice. These are not torn up. They're not really discolored. The tops aren't faded, which is very common for 90s car seats and stuff. You can see <clears throat> the seats just look phenomenal. Um, I... So yeah, the seats just look phenomenal. And, you know, same thing. The rest of the interior trim, your bins, everything in the back, it's all there. It's all in really good shape, all in black. It's got the partial shelf, or the... Uh, it has the privacy shelf here. Disregard my little flashlight, trying to make it brighter. Upper hatch plastic in good shape. All the plastic through here in good shape interior plastic all in good shape everything's looking proper the only real complaint is this is these little ties um the car didn't have the uh little hooks that go in here here and here if you can see them it's a little dark um the little hooks that go in here for the the privacy shelf to hook onto so it is just zip tied to the uh the hatch lifters i think those pieces are just a plastic piece that clips in um, I don't know if you can find them new. I'm not an FD guy, but that would be the only thing really to change back here. That, and I couldn't figure out what this stuff was. It was like a, you'll probably notice it in the pictures because it's the only part of the car that's not clean. It feels like some sort of an epoxy or something, maybe a glue from like putting the taillight lenses on in a previous life. I don't know, but no matter how much I scrubbed on this, I couldn't get it off and I didn't want to risk taking the paint off. So I got a majority of that off, but it's in really good shape. Otherwise you can see everything's super clean. Trays are super clean. All this stuff super clean. It has garage alpha floor mats and rear um, deck carpet. So all this fresh brand new carpet, not missing anything under there. It's just a really, really good example of a well put together FDR X7. Also, while we're standing here, look at this. This is an FD that has a mat pocket door. It still has the functional spring in it. How about that? I think this is actually, see that's right there is a bubble tech piece. I don't know if bubble tech is still in, but I think that's a reproduction door, but still finding a door like this prime window switches, not falling out door trim door panels, all in really good shape. I know on Johnny's black FD, that he had before this one, we did some substantial modifications to the passenger side door. And whoever buys this car, and if you own an FD, you should probably be telling all your passengers this. You never, ever, 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 ever want to close the door by this handle. If you grab this handle and try to close the door, you will rip this handle off the door. These doors are kind of heavy. You have to slam them. This, this is very fragile. So we had done on his black FD some reinforcement back here to try to get this and it was broken and it all come out. And you can see, you know, I won't go crazy, but you can see just it's a little flimsy. And that's just one of the issues after all of these have. It's 30 year old car, 30 year old plastic. They weren't that strong right here. Got to close the door by this the pocket or roll the window down and close it by the window frame. But well, it's another view of that center console. All the vents, nothing's cracked. Everything works. This car is fantastic. In addition to when the car got repainted, all the rubber seals, I know we put new outer window track seals on. I feel like these other ones were replaced, but I don't remember. It's not on my list of parts that were replaced, but regardless, all the rubber seals on the car are in really good shape. The door handles are in really good shape. There's no crazy marks and stuff around the door, pan door handles. Your rubber seal around the rear hatch is in really good shape. Same thing, front windshield seal in really good shape. Cow in really good shape. Everything on this car is very typical of a 57,000 mile car that has been well kept. All right guys, so I wanted to just clarify a few things about the front of the car, right? You know, cause I'm gonna make note and be completely honest with you guys that the, you know, the headlight to fender, you know, this gapping is not the most perfect thing in the world, right? And with reference to, obviously there was an accident with the car in 1999. None of this shows any evidence 
you know, there might be some extra um, seam sealer, you know, put on here. But none of this shows any evidence of it being not straight. You know, these fenders fit perfectly. You know, the fender too, this is obviously an OEM Mazda bumper, but it's still a plastic bumper, you know, from the 90s. So it's hard to get this stuff warps and doesn't fit perfect. You know, replacement headlight covers as well. And these cars are notorious for these headlight covers breaking off and going flying. But just wanted to really talk to and show you guys that, you know, there's no... Let me get my flashlight out, show you. Uh, but there's no major evidence or residual damage. My flashlight go. There. But, so there's no evidence or residual damage or anything, you know, to the actual frame of the car from that accident. I don't know what the scope of the accident was as far as, you know, the car fact says that it hit a guardrail. I mean, it could have hit a guardrail at five miles an hour. It could have hit it at 50. It doesn't say. But, you know, you can tell from in here that, you know, there's no evidence of the accident, residual evidence of the accident. Both aprons are very straight. You know, as far as I know, the engine bay is still the original paint for the car so there's some checking here you know um, but there's no major paint cracks or where the paints coming off um, and just kind of to show you again here you know I think that you know the body shop that painted the car unless you're a 90s Japanese car expert I think it's very hard to get pop-up headlights to fit correctly even with metal covers on an older RX-7 you know these have plastic covers um, but Honestly, as well, you know, I wouldn't be surprised just for any FD owner if you're driving this car, the headlight covers tend to just fly off. So, you know, you may have to fix it again in the future, owning an FD, just FD problems. So I'll close the hood and show you the fitment here in video a little bit closer. So there you can see good, consistent headlight to hood gap it does fit just a little bit tighter on the fender there. And this side, just the headlight fits evenly to the hood, but it's a little tighter gap than that side. So, really, you know, how Bring a Trailer typed and presented the ad, it may present that the uneven fitment in the front is from the accident, I can promise you. It's just how these cars fit. You know, go look at the pictures of any of the RX-7s that have sold on Bring a Trailer in the past. If you can get one of these to fit perfect, then you're a body shop god. So, I just wanted to show you that. I had to come out here and get some more pictures of it. This, that, and the other, and then happy to see this thing go to a new owner. The last and most important step of purchasing a new rotary car or a rotary car for you, use this, that, and the other. If it runs and you're not solely confident on the paperwork that's been provided by an engine builder, this, that, and the other, is to perform a compression test on your engine. So this is the rotary compression tester, compression tester. Um, I've had this one for a while. We had a different one before this for a while that Charles has. And these things work great. Easy to transport. Super nice unit. So how this works, it's written right up there on the side. We got to warm the engine up. We got to turn it off. Pull the trailing spark plugs out. We'll put the compression tester sensor, which is this deal, in the spark plug hole on the trailing. Crank the engine. You'll see when we get there. The little begin cranking thing on the screen will go away and then it'll tell you our compression numbers. I tend to do it two to three times. Just crank, remember the numbers, crank, remember the numbers, crank, remember the numbers. So that way it can kind of normalize and you should be getting consistent numbers as it goes. Then you switch to the other rotor and do that. So we're going to go ahead and do a compression test on this thing right now. Let this thing warm up. Gotta love that nice smooth stock port FD idle. Purrs like a kitten. If y'all ever remember, I don't know that I have a quarter handy, but I'll just use this dime as an example. Rolls Royce, Lexus, all your fancy luxury car brands brag. And they they have a right to do so. This is a feat. 
but they show that they balance a quarter on their engine vertically. It's like this one won't stay because there's a flat spot on its engine. But imagine they balance it vertically and then the engine sits there and runs and it doesn't fall over, which you can see this is way smoother than like a LS, but at the same time it ain't gonna stand up. Got some heat in the engine. Ready to swap this plug with the sensor. And get some numbers. Now, the reason you warm these up, aside from wanting to burn your hands, changing spark plugs, is on the rotor, all the seals are spring-loaded. If you know anything about metal, when metal gets warm, it gets soft. When a spring gets soft, it puts less pressure, thus creating less compression when the engine is warm. Typically, your cold compression numbers are higher than your warm compression numbers. Both are a good tell of what is happening inside the engine, whether it's healthy or not. But a more accurate, more consistent, we warm it up. So... All right guys, rear rotor. I cranked it three times. They've pretty much normalized right in about this amount, so we'll read them off. We've got 83, 87, 77. Now, here I'll show it to you. So this compression tester records the cranking speed, so you can see the RPM there, 256, which is actually really fast. Um, this car has a the upgraded like RX-8 starter. And then you'll see the corrected numbers, which I think they probably already passed. So there, corrected numbers, 83, 87, 8, 77. With that cranking speed being so high, it doesn't really have to do much RPM correction. So the reason that it does an RPM correction is because if you have a slow starter, the starter doesn't have as much torque on the engine. Thus, higher compression is going to show a lower number with a slower starter. Does that make sense? So, this starter has no problem cranking this over. Let's check the front one, and we'll talk about the numbers. Alright, front rotor. Normalize, cranked it a bunch. Come around here. 80, 89, 79, corrected. It's basically the same. 80, 89, 79. So now let's talk about what those numbers mean to somebody like me, rotary guy, going to buy a rotary engine. You want to see what's going on. So the good thing about those numbers is that they're consistent from the front rotor to the rear rotor. You're looking at, we'll just say, mid to high 80s for compression all the way through. Those numbers are warm numbers. So if we would have done this compression test with the engine cold, they probably would have been mid to high 90s, which to most people looks super desirable. They're stoked. Mid to high 90s on a rebuilt engine is really good. Now, the reason I say rebuilt engine, when you rebuild a rotary engine, there's no way to effectively, you can resurface a rotor housing, which I know that these weren't, but there's no way to effectively hone or put new rings or like you know, or put oversized rings or do whatever to make up that gap in wear, right? So when you're buying or installing a rebuilt engine, you are putting new rings effectively on a unhoned cylinder surface. It's going to take a while for the compression to bake in. Also, it's going to take a while for just the engine to build compression. You have to wear things together. Now, this engine, I know it had, we'll say, 10 to 15,000 miles on it, put, put on it in the car that it was in before we put it in this car. Now, in this car, this engine probably has, I think, what, it had 51,000 on it when Johnny bought it, and it's got 57,000 on it now, so 6,000 miles. So this engine has 20,000 miles. 
I would say it's probably not going to come up in compression anymore, but I don't think it's on the verge of being hurt. It's not going to lose any compression. It's a good running engine. The car starts just fine, hot, cold, whatever. And it had all new stuff put in it when it was rebuilt. So you're not worried about a rebuilt engine using a ton of used parts, right? This is a good engine. The compression numbers are conducive of a used rebuilt engine, especially hot numbers. Brand new from Mazda. I've got a new engine in a box over here. In a future video, we're going to compression test that and see what a brand new engine makes compression wise. I think that a lot of people are a little bit uh, overzealous to expect that a rebuilt engine should make what a new engine is going to make compression wise. There's no way to, to like fix this to be new using used parts. FD, cold start. smoke no nothing weird let it warm up we'll do a hot start for you fd's up the temperature you see there running turn it off fires right up just like it should everything you need to know I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope that uh, this video showed you the condition of this car in addition to just talking about FDs for a little bit. Um, I didn't want to film just a boring walk around and driving and whatever, whatever video um, as much as all the bring a trailer stuff is just like that. But, you know, and that shows the cars. It's better than a ton of pictures or you get both. But uh, I wanted to make this a little more interesting, make it fun for the, the guys on the channel. And uh, I hope that whoever buys the car is, one, happy with the transparency shown in the sale because I'm 100% not going to sell somebody something without making sure they know everything about it. They know every issue it has, this, that, and the other. And uh, we want to make sure you get a good car. So with that, thank you guys very much for watching. We'll see you guys in the next one. Keep it ran.